those of you that don't know me, I'm Dave Smith. I'm the host for this meeting. Co-host is Noel Hell. Good afternoon. Um, I can see we've got some new names, well, different names from this morning. So uh, um, for those of you that weren't in on it on this session this morning, and I, I have, I am legally obliged to read you this notice, which says that in view of the fact that we are recording this session, if anybody doesn't want to be visible on the recorded version, you know, you can you have the opportunity to um, cancel your video so that you're not you're not seen and also if there are any, any children and looking down the names I can't see anybody that looks to be of uh, junior age but you 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 need to have parental permission to uh, to join in a session that's being recorded um, as always the your Microphones are muted, and this is really to cut out any background noise or any any other sounds which um, would cause an annoyance to Nigel and make him lose concentration on what he's doing. Um, if, it is. Um, if you select, if you select from your view option, which is top right hand corner of your screen, if you select gallery, uh, sorry, speaker view, then Whoever is doing the speaking is full screen, and in the case of Nigel doing his bit, you'll be able to see what he's doing more closely. And the only other thing I need to tell you is that if you want to ask any questions, down at the bottom of your screen you will see the chat uh, speech bubble. Click on that, and that brings up a, uh, a chat window. And you can type in your question, which everybody will be able to see. Or, in fact, if you want to speak to somebody who's on the list, um, see the list of names or the names on, on each of the person's pictures above. If you want to talk to anybody in private, you can actually communicate with each other by that means. But most, mostly, um, if, you, if you select the chat to all, and then uh, we'll all see the questions that are being asked. So I'll hand you over to Nigel. Nigel is in Slovakia. So it's the middle of the afternoon for Nigel. Um, and he'll be able to tell you what he's, what he's building. And uh, we can see what progress has made over the lunch hour. They're eating. <laughs> Oh, right, yeah, okay. Yeah. Uh, good afternoon, yeah. everybody. Over to you, Nigel. Dave, do you think it's worth... Sorry, I've got screw in my mouth. Do you think it's worth putting up those photos again? Yes, I will. I can uh, show you oh, a picture of what it is. That Nigel's building. Here we go. While Dave's doing that, I will say um, I'm building a Stockton and Darlington Railway Jinx's Baby. More about that in a second. Um, when it was, although when it was originally built, it was built as a 440. Um, everybody thinks the Stockton and Darlington Railway finished on the in uh, 1925, 18, 1925, 1825. But of course, it carried on until the 1860s. And whilst in the 1860s, and indeed onwards from there, there was a their last engineer, chap by the name of Bush, who was the brother of the Bush that uh, built the Tay Bridge, the first one. Um, he was uh, the chief engineer for the Stockton, and he continued to be their engineer after they were absorbed into the Northeastern Railway in 1863, I think it is. Um, so his, uh, his locomotive, this Jinx's baby, 
continued into Northeastern Railway time. And I decided that I wanted to build a model of this, but to keep it with the other models I've got I'm building, I decided to build it as a modified uh, locomotive. Uh, the photo you see on the screen there is of Jinx's baby, not as a 440, but as a 240, um, just after it was rebuilt in about 1881 by Edward Fletcher. So it's got the same um, As a 240, and it's got inside cylinders as opposed to outside cylinders. Um, the reason why I fancied building this uh, this model is because of the nice cutout splashes. Um, don't really see that in many northeastern locomotives. Certainly, as they get older, into, sorry, younger, uh, when you get into the more sort of F class, which is a D something or other in, in, in LNER flavour, there's no cutout splashes. So I decided I wanted to build that. Um, I'm not going to be painting it, that's going to go to Warren Haywood, I remembered his name this time, um, and it will be painted in this livery. Um, it is the same livery as the, as the class 901 that you see in the National Rail Museum, or the long boiled Stockton and Darlington Loco 1275 that's in the museum at North Road um, in Darlington. This um, locomotive is quite an interesting design. Um, Bush put in lots and lots of ideas uh, into into you know, novel ideas into making this uh, into a you know, into a modern in those days express passenger loco. Seven foot drivers, they, the driving wheels are very, very close together. Um, so as you can see in this drawing here, that's just come up now, um, the driving wheels are almost touching. So I've had to ex extend the wheelbase of the, uh, of the coupled wheels by about three inches. So now it is a four, uh, seven foot six, I think it is. Uh, Premier components, yeah, seven foot six plane coupling rod, which is 52 millimeters in our part or in, in metric. Um, I have so I'm just making it a little bit wider. Um, also, um, because it's very, very tight, is the, the boiler is slightly smaller. I've taken the inside diameter of the boiler, i.e., the boiler before cladding, and that's so. This is now a 28 mil boiler instead of a 30 mil. It also matches some rather fine parts that have been made by Doug Hay, who had his Whitby layout on show a few weeks ago. Um, the drawing here, um, which you can see, shows a few interesting things. The pivot for the, for the bogey is in a cup and ball arrangement, which is quite novel. There you go. Um, a lot of people thought that it just sort of floated around and wasn't connected to the loco. So the bogey uh, could, have, could have escaped, shall we call it? But I don't think that's true. I think it is actually, there's a ring, a collar around the top of the, the, uh, the cup, which will hold it in place. God help the fitter who had to go in there and tighten it, but you know, it's another thing. Um, at the rear of the loco, beneath the foot plate in the cab, there is a big box and the water from the boiler, uh, from the tender, the boiler, it isn't really, it's quite low down. It was this tank across to the loco, two foot six wide, sorry, two foot six deep and three foot six wide, I think it is. Um, and then it feeds down some pipes into a pump, which is uh, just behind the rear axle of, there we go, well done, David. It goes into a pump, which the driver, when he wanted to top up the water in the boiler, he'd obviously open a valve or whatever, and uh, it would pump water into the boiler. The boiler tubes, that is not a distortion from my photocopier or my photograph. The boiler tubes do actually bend down slightly as they go to the end of the, um, 
uh, as they enter into the smoke box. So all in all, it's a bit of a weird machine. Um, the reason why it was called a Jinx's baby was it, it, it ran into all sorts of problems, um, mainly surrounding the, um, the, the, valve, the valve gear inside the loco, which was made of brass, which expanded at a different, different rate to the metal in the, inside the, well, the pistons, indeed, um, and caused all sorts of seizing problems. He tried, uh, Bush tried all sorts of special lotions and potions to make it work using various types of graphite grease, but it was never successful. So when Fletcher got hold of it, as we see in this photo here, he took out the outside cylinders and he, he corrected the, uh, the, the valve gear and uh, or the valves inside the, uh, inside, the, um, cylind inside the cylinders to make it run a little bit better. And indeed this locomotive lasted into the 1900s. Um, but as we see it here, it is in its 1881 livery and I quite like it. So I think that's what it's going to be. Um, so thank you, David. I think that's bored people enough about that. Well, um, I, was looking, I was looking for the picture of the uh, painted one that's in the uh, Shildon Museum. Um, I'll quickly oh, yeah, find that, find. at least people can, people can see what it's going to look like when it's painted. Um, yeah, oh, you're doing that. I'm going to just you. see if my USB video is working. And of course it isn't. God's sake, what's going on? You find it, Dave, and I'll... Yep. Let's be connected. Yeah, we'll connect into my... This was working before. What have you, lo you, what have you, me, what have you lost, uh, Nigel? I lost my picture. Bloody thing. Flipping GoPros, oh. I tell you. We can't see you either. Yep. Right. So we'll switch back to the other picture. No, don't stop video. Just. There we go. We're back again. Did you find that? Is this, are you using Are you using a different camera now? No, I'm using exactly the same camera. I had it uh, plugged in. It's been on charge for the entire duration, been operating, and now I've just just done that, and it won't. It's not. I think it. I think it's the. Um, Bloody have it, will it? Bloody hell. Excuse my French, everybody. All right. Rather than that, it doesn't matter really because the work that I'm doing this afternoon is related around this Poppy's large local builder box. And I'm sorry, you might be getting a repeat um, on another channel. But that's the point I'm at with this model. Um, as we are at the moment, I have now, for those that were watching earlier on today, I have uh, put the, uh, all the horn box in and the one on, on the bogey, on the uh, driver is now wobbling up and down. The rear bearing is now in place. And I'm, I'm now in a position where I can start assembling the model. Da, da, da. So I had to think at lunchtime how to do this because we all had a long chat about uh, uh, what the best way was to do that. Good afternoon, Mr. Scarborough, sir. Um, and um, what uh, I concluded was if I put it into this rig, it would be whole, held in a nice square situation, as you can see here, and uh, it would be able to be, then the only thing I needed to do, this is square, he says, that's square, this is square. So the only thing I needed to do or to worry about is the space between the frames, which is 24 millimeters. Mm -hmm. 
he says. Because there were no, as, as you've seen earlier on, there were a series of drawings. This is, the, this is a O-gauge enlarged version of, of the drawing that David had. I've also drawn said locomotive on a graph paper. So I have been able to work out, well, it's basically, it's a working drawing for, for, for constructing this thing. And I've been able to visualize it so that I can, so that I can make it, um, so I can make sure that everything fits. So. I've just found the color photo of the uh, logo, shall I? Yeah, by all means. I'll quickly show that so that you can, so everybody can see the livery, which it will hopefully, Hopefully, in, end up in. Who knows? You all see that? Yeah. There we go. So it's quite a nice livery. As pointed out this morning, the uh, Slight difference between this one and the one you're making, Nigel, is the fact that the splashes are different and have this lovely fancy radial slots like yours has. Yes, yeah. Um, and the, um, the reversing gear passes through the, um, through the splasher. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> A challenge to paint that, wouldn't it? But... Um, in view of the time it took you to cut out all your apertures in your splashes, I would venture to suggest that this, what we're looking at here is the cheapskate version. Yeah, probably gave, gave them more access as well. So I would There's have the uh, dimensions of the loco. Great tubes, wheelbase. So it's about the same. It's about the this same. one. This one has seven foot uh, couple drivers. Did you did you say that yours has smaller driving wheels? No, no. This is seven foot as well. And this okay. So uh, yeah. Anyway, there it is. My model hasn't got as quite as many quite enough um, spokes, but. Uh, Beggars can't be choosers in this instance. This, so I, I'm just using the, um, the Slater's, Slater's wheels and uh, very nice they are too. This model actually that I'm building is actually very, very old. <laughs> Here's one I prepared earlier. Um, this, is a, uh, this is the 440 version, which I started in my youth when I was at the, uh, a member of the Keith and Model Railway Club, or, well, I'm not a member of the Keith and Model Railway Club, but I am a member of the Keith the 7mm group. Um, and one of my colleagues, Mr. Taylor, is yakketing away about building cottages at the moment, I believe. Um, well, he's, he's just put a comment on to say that he's got class 901 on his workbench at present. He has. Yeah, he, he has. I was going to say that. Robin, Robin is uh, working on... On Excuse me a second. Patrick, what? I've, you've been told. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and Arthur is asking, Arthur Moore is asking, are you making the boiler detachable to make painting easier? I'm making as much detachable as possible, Arthur. Um, so as I built on this, on this model, said boiler will it, it, it is removable. Um, I, don't, I believe in being fair to, to people that paint models. Uh, I mean, I've tried painting models and I, I fail miserably in getting it looking pretty. Um, and the biggest complaint I think from, from the professional painters is that they get supplied these things, say, can you paint this? And then they suddenly realize that the, the front of the sandboxes have to be lined out and they can't get in there because the bot the um uh the smoke box is in in the way so they don't make the sandboxes removable or, or anything so yes um everything will be removable uh, including the 
Oh, very, very pretty. You know, I go into there, there's sunshine there, isn't there? Very pretty dome that's been turned up for me by another mate of mine from the Keithy group, old Dougie, who you will have seen on, on the, his model railway of Whitby a few weeks ago. Um, so yeah, I'm going to make it as dismantleable, but dismantleable as possible. And what's the what's the opposite to dismantle? I know it's assembled, but why don't you call it? Why don't you mantle something? Just a question to ponder while I while I prepare to burn my fingers. Butter fingers. Yes, be Butter fingers, indeed. Yeah. Um, if you can hear what sounds like a crying child in the background, it's a Burmese cat who went to the vet yesterday. You already said that. And uh, he is back now, and, and he's and he's he's a bit of a moaning so and so. Didn't really appreciate his uh, his operation. Right, I'm going to tack tack this in place and see what we get. This part here is one of the stretchers. I have already prepared it for, um, it, it, it will also, that didn't set so did it? It will also um, um, hold the, um, the, oh God, I've forgotten the name. The coupling between the boiler, uh, between the loco and the tender. So I have pre-drilled that centrally. I did that last night. Yes. But um, the, I'm now going to burn my fingers. Mm -hmm. can, we see, can we see this clearly enough? We can see your fingers glowing red, yeah. See my fingers growing red. Right. The, I'm using a resistance. We shall, we, we shall hear the screams. Yeah. Uh, so Andy, Dun Andy Duncan's presentation earlier in the week mm -hmm. about, uh, I can't remember what he called it, it was hot burn out or something. Yeah. yeah, right. And this is definitely another hot burn out scenario here. <sighs> and it's also not taking for some reason. Are you using any flux on that, uh, Nigel? I am. What sort, what type are you using? A liquid or paste? I use a liquid flux. Um, oh, sorry, acid cars, based. Cars red flux. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I quite like it because it works well. It works very well. And some of, some of the fluxes, if you, if, you, if you leave a residue, I mean, don't get me wrong, I do clean these things after, after they've been worked on. But, um, the residue seems to, um, I think it must be more water-based or something, because it doesn't seem to leave anything. And it, and it certainly doesn't leave anything acidic, which sort of starts coming through the paintwork after, after six months. There we go, right. So, phase one done. And the question is, is what is the width there? And the answer is nearly. 24 millimetres. We'll need just tweaking out a fraction, but 23.75 mil. You can't see that, can you? Can you not worry about it. Um, so the chassis assembly has started. Um, all of this is made out of nickel silver. We had a conversation earlier on. So for those of coming back again, I'm sorry, but I like nickel silver. Um, it solders beautifully um, and it cuts cuts nicely as well. And, you know, if you ever have the opportunity- it Takes paint to, better. Say again? Makes paint better as well. Makes paint better, solders better. Yeah, so it's all together a much nicer material. 
You um, still use an acid flux on nickel silver? I used to use Carl's red flux. I don't know what it's Sorry, not, not flux. Primer. Wrong word. Uh, an operation. Or does your painter do that? Well, I have given up. For, for all these fancy liveries, I've given up on painting. Um, so I think Warren paints his locos using... Um, I forgot the word. I've been living away for too long. Acidate. Uh, what do they paint cars with? <laughs> Extra primer. They paint it with X primer and he uses, he doesn't use enamels, he uses... Cellulose. Say Cellulose. Cellulose. Thank you, Dougie. You get top marks. Look at it. It's, it's I don't know, what time is it in the morning now? Half one? Oh, God. Half two. Half two? Are you, uh, so you're exactly 12 hours different from me. So, uh, good lad. You don't look very tired. Yeah, my eyes are drooping a bit, but I'll try and bat it out. Have you ordered a curry from the Taj recently? No, 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 no. I haven't had a curry from there for a bit. You've still got the menu. It must be last year's one. I can see it behind you. Um, oh, yes, yes, the menu <laughs> all the Yes, I always keep that handy. There you go. Um, I think so, it's yeah. so he paint, so he will paint it with cellulose. Uh, and I guess he uses a, an etch primer of some description. Uh, I used to work in the spray painting industry selling spraying equipment. So I also use a, an etch primer, but some of the models I build, I just slap a bit of, uh, just a bit of, just a bit of spray acrylic primer on it. And it I think it's uh, worth mentioning, Nigel, that um, what they call cellulose, pro uh, cellulose paints nowadays, uh, are not like the old cellulose paints. Um, they're not quite as, um, what's the word, volatile. Um, well, mainly, be yeah. mainly because they're not allowed to put these dangerous solvents now in paints. Um, Aren't cars painted with water, water solvent paint? A, a lot of, uh, a, a lot of it. When I when, when I left the spray painting industry, they were all going onto high volume, low pressure paint guns and water-based paint and you know painting with acrylics I, I do not get on with acrylics at all I it just I, I may, maybe I need to practice but and understand the techniques required, but I don't get on with, with, with acrylics but that's me uh, but of course all of the main paints that you buy from um, Precision paint and, and the like. I think most of them you can still buy them as uh, as enamel anyway. So, mm. so it's more okay. Well, uh, Nigel, right. I've always, I've always uh, had a, an inkling to to have a a bead blaster to clean the model and pre surface prepare it before painting. Just that you, you, it actually indents the surface mi microscopically and gives a good key for paint, you know. And that's, that's a good point, yeah. But uh, I, I've got I've got one of those, Dougie. Um, I've only used it, I think, about once or twice in in as long as I've owned it, which is about twenty years. You're quite welcome to borrow it if you want to come over and. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> a bit heavy though. <laughs> <laughs> is that a Geisen bead blaster? The main problem with them is you've got to keep the sand that you use has got to be absolutely dry and you've got to keep changing it regularly because once you've used it and removed the paint or you know, removed the surface off metal, the paint, the, the, uh, the sand becomes contaminated. And, um, yeah, that, that, that's right. And also, the, there are very fine grades as well of beads mm. that's not very sharp, you know, not too destructive. But it's a messy business. I've used industrial ones and it gets all over the floor. You know, what a mess it makes. But well, the yeah. problem is, you see, when you're using it, the inside of the cabinet becomes pressurised. Yeah. So even though, it, even though the lid shuts down and it's got clipped all around it, which supposedly make it airtight, 
the, the air can still escape and of course the, the the fine dust also comes out with it and you find it you'll find it all over the workshop when you've been using it mm. you know yeah 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 but I, I think it would be a really good way of preparing a surface for paint oh it and is it, yeah it cleans, it cleans all your muck off as well you know <laughs> all your yeah. solder residues and flux residues it all comes off with that but uh, I don't possess one. <laughs> for, uh, for painting, um, at the last virtual show that I had, I think it was Rathbone, Ian, Ian Rathbone, I think Ian it Rathbone, was, yeah. did a superb, very, very well presented um, piece about preparation, preparing your model for painting. Didn't even touch painting it, it was just preparing it. And it was, it was very, very good indeed and very clear um, about what he wants it from 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 the model so that for, for so you know for him for him to paint it or for obviously for you to take it forward for painting as i yeah. mentioned in your previous uh, well last year's presentation nigel when we yep. got we got a we got off on a bit of a tangent. We, we, if you recall, we spent quite a time talking about um, various types of etch primer. And it was told to me by a, somebody in the profession um, that when, you're, when you apply primer, if you can see it after you've sprayed it on, then you've, you've put too much on. Too much on. Mm. You, you, have to, you have to put a very, very thin layer because it has to allow the atmosphere to get through to the metal, to oxidize the metal. Because that's what etch primers do. They, they actually cause, the, they cause microscopic, um, well, corrosion, I suppose it is the word, of, of the surface of, of the metal. And if you put too much on, of course, the, uh, the, the air can't get through to it. So, um, you know, you're not doing yourself any favors by uh, putting... Well, by putting loads and loads of primer on. That's etch primer, yeah? Yeah. Interesting. My workbench is a mess again. I work by the same principle as all of us. I'm working about, about five inch space. Well, those of you who've ever been into my workshop, you'll see that I have a, um, a sign which says, a tidy bench is a sign of a sick mind. <laughs> I think you're right. Yeah. Didn't know you got one, Dave. <laughs> I mean, a bench. <laughs> yes, it's called a shelf. <laughs> Used as a shelf. <laughs> it's so cluttered that when I, when I need to do anything where I need a bit of room, I have to use the, the dining room table. <laughs> <laughs> So, we've now got a cloud, uh, what looks like it's going to be a snow cloud of some description in front of, in front of the sun, so I can actually see a bit better. I've been working like this. We're cloudy here. Well, you, you needn't send it over to us. No. You don't want any snow. No. no, we had our fair share earlier in the year. One thing, resistant soldering iron is very good. Resistant soldering is very good. It works really well when you make an electrical circuit. So on the floor, I've got a transformer with three steps in it. I've got a button to press to make the circuit. I've got a probe with a carbon tip, which creates the resistance. I've got this mounted in a poppy's large local builder box which is made of wood and I've got the other end clipped onto the wood rather than onto the metal so I think the score is nil point right now when I press this I've got a bit of a circuit going Yes, I think you'll find that wood is a good insulator, Nigel. <laughs> ah. Right, that's loose. So now 
I can finally set this to the required. Good. There, there was a picture on, I think it was Facebook uh, a month or so back of a, a young lady doing some soldering. And um, she was holding the, um, holding, holding the soldering iron like a pencil, about an yeah. inch from the end of the soldering iron. That was a posed photograph, I hope. <laughs> I hope so. Well, cut that. Oof. I think that's what you call an interference fit. Right. Slap bang on. Right. So there's two parts. There's, uh, um, we also had this morning the conversation about those quarter, quarter inch square blocks into user spaces, like the one I used on this model here, this original model. Um, very difficult to solder. They're very difficult to solder. If the if you have to, they, they have a countersunk screw which tends to not fill the countersink or if you can countersink the frame. Um, my frames are over scale, um, but they're not as thick as you see on some models. I must say they're probably about half the thickness of certainly some of the old coarse scale models that you see. Um, 16 brass. So, um, so what I have, uh, what I intend to do with this model is, is I'm using the, uh, the, the, the local builder box to create a jig by which A, I can make sure that the, um, I'll do that next actually, the coupling rods actually fit and, and also use it to assemble the frames use it to actually assemble the frames and I will use proper frame spaces based on the drawings from the um, uh, Locomotive Magazine, February the 15th, 1906. If you want to read about, uh, about Jinx's baby, it's all there. So, um, so yeah, so I've got, I've got some idea about the frame spacing. Um, I think I might put in a something, something temporarily um, Around where the smoke box would go, so that then I can I can finish assembling this. Should I or should I just actually get on and do it properly? I don't know. Um, but um, there's 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 two big pieces, two two big pieces across the back of the locomotive, either side forming a sandwich for the for the coupling between the loco and the tender. Um, there's a there's a spacer between uh, the frames just in front of the boiler and then you've obviously got the, um, the cylinder block which will, will in the real thing obviously is, is a fairly major piece that would hold the, the, the two frames together as well. Um, yeah that brings up an interesting question are you going to be able to source the correct um, pattern Style of cylinders, or are you going to have to fabricate those? Do you think, Nigel? I probably will be a fabrication. Will probably be a fabrication of lies, <laughs> <laughs> because looking here, this is the this is the um, outside cylinder version, and, so, and I have well, there are very very few photographs of Jinx's babies, and of course. You never get the photograph that you want showing the inside of the cylinders. I don't think there's any drawings available. Uh, I'm a member of the Northeast Railway Association and I think the answer really would to be maybe ask Robin if he's actually been and photographed it or ask somebody to photograph between the frames of uh, the 901 class at, um, uh, I don't know where it is, it must be in the National Rail Museum is it? Always used to be, I know that. But I guess that way you could you could probably see the see the cylinders. Right. 
cardboard over in I the recycling site. What's about between Shildon and uh, and the York Museum? Does it? Sometimes Darlington as well. Yeah. Keep moving them round. Oh, actually, I think it's not even there. I think it's at Stainmore. Really? There's a yeah. I think it's in Stainmore, at the sta in the old station building, which is which is now sort of part of the part of this museum that they're doing there. All right. Well, I'm a bit out of date with uh, what's occurring yeah. in the UK. You and me both, mate. <laughs> You'll be interested to know, uh, Nigel, that your erstwhile neighbour has just joined us. My erstwhile neighbour. Good afternoon, Mr. Bennett, sir. Well, he's still fiddling around with his screen at the moment. All I can see is a, is a hand. <laughs> that would be Does funny. Peter know what's on the shelf you, by your right sh uh, left shoulder? Um, well, you bloody told me. <laughs> <you know. laughs> well said, sir. I saw that earlier. <laughs> uh, that work on that has has uh, paused while I while I do uh, this. You are. You should be able to talk now. There you go. There you are. Say hello. Good afternoon. Can you hear me, Nigel? Hello, Peter. I can. Nice yeah. to see you. Good. And you? Well, I'll listen. You carry on. Hi, Good. Nigel. Hi, June. <laughs> it's very sociable, this, uh, this oh, session. Took a little while. Um, yes, it is, at Stain, it is at Stainmore, according it's to Wikipedia. Yeah. Kirk, Kirkby Stephen. Right. Kirkby Stephen, that's it. Kirkby Stephen Station. Um, it's quite an interesting <laughs> location, that. It's one of those places I want to visit when I... Moved there in 2011. There you go. Yeah, they're doing a lot there. They've, uh, they've if you like northeastern, they, they, they're very working very hard on that. I've got a northeastern tool, not tool van, stores van that they're that they're getting uh, that they're restoring. They've done an amazing job on that. Right. So the um, this builder box, which is being demonstrated elsewhere um, I've now put the, um, the coupling rods in place so in theory it's a little bit tight you see just a little bit tight so what I'm going to do to make sure that it's all true and square is I'm going to apply some heat on the on the fixed uh, bearing because I left it with a very tiny little bit of wiggle room. So, in theory, on the wiggle basis, room. Nigel, on the basis that you're going to fit inside valve gear, which I think we all we all decided this morning that you should. Um, therefore, you're going to have to drive it on the rear axle. Uh, how much room have you got to get a motor in? Uh, I, yeah, we all discussed that at lunch um, this morning, and at lunchtime I, I actually investigated that, and it's worse than the, um, the, the, the attempt I made at driving the F-Class from the rear axle. There is no room at all. Well, there is room, but the motor would go straight up through the, through the, um, through the back of the cab, or the front of the cab. So I don't think it's going to happen, I'm afraid. You have to do what a, a very old friend of ours long, long since passed away, used to put them in um, any old motor he could get in the tender and a piece of curtain rail, curtain rod through to the, to the back, to the driving wheels. Yeah. Um, we still need a gearbox. 
He used to use, make the locos out of cardboard. <laughs> <laughs> you'd still need you'd still need a gearbox, wouldn't you? Yeah. Um, I one of one of the long term jobs or things I've got all the bits for it except for the motor and the gearbox because I can't decide on how to do it. I want to make a Northeastern Railway J class. I don't think they lasted into the LMA, uh, but it's a single and it's got outside steam chests. So the valve gear uh, is on the outside of the, of the frames. So it drives and it's driven from the inside. So it drives through a very interesting, wibbly, cranky thing um, mounted on the on the inside of the frames, and transmits through and then into the uh, uh, to the outside and, and into the um, uh, into the the valves on the uh, um, on the outside on the outside steam. You say that was a single. Yeah, it's a single. Was there a, a an Atlantic or a four four zero in that configuration, with inside cylinders and outside valve gear? I saw, finally saw a picture this week of a loco with outside valve gear. Did the what was the four cc, Dougie? Clat had. Where's the valve gear on that? The valve gear was on the inside. That was on the. It, it were it were all on the inside the valve gear. It, it, it certainly didn't have anything on the outside. Uh, but take note of it. I think you might be right with other end. There may well be other engines. I'm trying to think. But uh, the, the look my mind at the moment if there were any more. I can't think of a. Um, I'm turning this upside down. Because um, I think I need to get a bit more solder in here. Um, but the North Eastern Railway, by the by, the turn of the century, it was getting fairly standardised, wasn't it? Didn't really do anything too wacky. No, well, that's true. Makes sense to have the valve gear on the outside, though, doesn't it, for access for maintenance? Oh. They're the bits that they're the bits that wear out quicker. Indeed. <coughs> that, that's why the Northeastern Railways look goes are much easier to model. Because <laughs> <laughs> you ain't got so much glutton on the outside. Yeah. Thank God for Mr. Fletcher for, for making this as a uh, as a four four oh as a two four oh I beg your pardon. That wooden box seems to be a pain in the neck, Nigel. Uh, I think that would be on the to, fire if it were mine. <laughs> it's actually starting to irritate somewhat because the... Because <laughs> I'm using it to do the, to assemble the frames and the frames aren't really ready, so... It's all a little bit of a... It's worth mentioning that that, that Loco Builder box is produced by um, um, Poppy's Wood Tech is being demonstrated at this moment or sometime during this afternoon. Uh, all these videos and presentations, of course, are or will be available to watch after today. So if you were to watch that presentation, you might see how... How to do it properly. How to do it. <laughs> I wasn't going to say that, but... Uh... That's interesting. See, that, the reason why it's actually tight on the... Um... That's interesting. Can I get this out? That would suggest misalignment of your axle boxes, wouldn't it? Well... Yeah. I think a three sixteenth reamer through the middle of that would solve that problem. Yes, I've got a somewhere. Anyway, I can't we get find a picture of that loco in 
Mm. If we were to, when I would have turned it the other way up and reassemble it again, we can get a bit more solder in there. Is Robin still watching or has he gone away? I think Robin's doing his own thing, isn't he, on the... Uh... No, it's finished. Isn't he it's with finished. the... Is he with the tech committee? Oh yes, he might be. He might, he might be on the... Yeah, that's on until quarter past three. He accused me of being, he gave me the nickname of Mr. Blobby, which is a lie. I tell you, it's a lie. My soldering's very neat. But um, I think this time, this period, just to get the frames something like, I am going to have to do the... Whoop, have to have to do it. Anybody else got any ideas? Start again. The great thing about this is that where I'm soldering now is it's going to be it's going to be a, a um, the firebox is going to be sitting there so there's no problems no issues you, if that axle is so tight in the actual box is nigel you're going to be you're going to have to be careful how you do remove it so that it doesn't pick up and seize otherwise you'll never get it out without no what what's it it's, not, the box um, it's just it's revolving it, it's just a little bit tight but what I'm going to do is I'm going to, I'm going to get these, this frame spacer in place properly, or at least, as Rodney says, Mr. Blobby style. So it ain't going anywhere. And then I can, I'll put the, the resistance iron on it. What's that the, that you just touched onto it before you soldered? What's what I just touched just in front of your right hand, what's that bit of kit? No, 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 no. L lying on the... Wasn't it your, your flux source? My flux? Yeah, how do you apply yeah. the flux? Uh, I, put it on, I put it on with an old, very old... Uh, oh, he's woken up. Can you see him? Poor old boy. <laughs> hey, you all right? What what do you do with the cat then, Nudge? Uh, he had a he had a bladder infection, Dougie. Oh dear. And and frankly, he couldn't pee. So so we took it. Yeah, I know. Tell me about it. <laughs> Christ. Oh, he had a bladder infection. Took him to the vet, and they and he couldn't pee, so they uh, they opened him up, and they found his bladder was um, furred up. I think is the technical term. Oh dear! Do you want to get down? Come on! I'm sorry, chaps. Come on! There you go. Off you go. There he goes. 16-year-old Burmese cat. So wearing a chastity belt. He's 16 years old, so I guess uh, if you're 16 years well, not 16 years old, but if you're the, uh, I don't know what it is in, in cat years. Anyway, back to the flux. You, you, you were just about to say that you apply it with, that's it, that bit of kit. What is that, an old file or something? It's just an old file. All oh, right, yeah, okay. Just an old file, and um, and this is just a, just a bit of old. Uh, you only you only need the slightest little drop then on the end of that to. Uh, oh yeah. To do I, the use, job. I use a paintbrush. Well, I used to use paintbrush, and then another paintbrush, and then another paintbrush. Oh yeah, yeah. I only use old ones. Yeah. Yeah. So. Does it put too much on? Uh. I don't think so. I don't think so. I've never really worried about putting too much flux on because it always seems to burn off, especially this stuff. Somebody might might like to correct us or correct me. 
is there a is there a, a maximum amount of flux you can put on it's all about cleaning up isn't it it's all about it's only enough to clean the areas that you're soldering exactly i see we've got ian middleditch on who's a master loco builder have you got any opinions on this ian well yeah I've been, i tend to use one of these syringe i've got a couple one for uh, phosphoric and one for uh, easy flow uh, or power flow i uh, should say um you just get a drop on exactly where you want it and if you put too much on you can suck it back off all right and if you put too much on ian what What's the problem? Just need to wash What's the off? problem? Well, it's wasteful. It costs money. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. I'm a Yorkshireman, so... I know I in... um, yeah. I think the biggest waste of flux has got nothing to do with the application of it. It's when you knock it over. <laughs> yeah. Done that. Been there. Yeah, everybody's done it. When you use one of these, <laughs> runs all under the crack under the back of my yeah workbench. Just um, off a, um, a little foam box with a hole cut in the middle. Work to stop doing that. Yeah, I've got something similar that yeah. a friend made for me. On the subject a wooden, of a wooden jar holder. On the subject of flux, there's that stuff which is phosphoric acid, is it? That's what. Which is which is deadly stuff. Well, and that's what ours red is. Yeah, well, I, I'll show you this model. Now, this is a little demo model which I made, which I'm sure many of you have already seen. Um, and it was it was a it was a model to demonstrate the uh, or a little little diorama, if you want to call it that. To demonstrate the uh, use of corrugated iron steel sheets, which I used to produce, which I intend to reintroduce at some time, and I soldered up this little shed. Can you see it? Yep. And I soldered it up using phosphoric acid flux. And I went to have my lunch, and when I came back, the whole thing had got, the whole thing had gone rusty. So that is real rust, gentlemen. If you rub your finger on it, it comes off on your fingers. It's that is actual real rust. Real uh, corrugated steel. Ah, oh, yeah, no yeah. zinc on it. <laughs> so uh, none of your rust-coloured paint on there. It's the real, real thing. It also it also sent all the tools rusty. Actually, any surface rust, it does, it does rub off, you know, off the uh, screwdrivers and your rules and things. But you have to be a bit careful with it because it, uh, you know, it is. Yes, if you've got too nice. much flux on it and it, uh, it, it boils off anything steel around it, yeah. like your axles, will corrode. Especially if it does that to steel... God knows what it does to your lungs if you inhale the fumes. <laughs> uh, nearly, uh, come on, there we go. This is a temporary spacer. Set at 24 millimeters. What spacing do, do other people put their frames on their models? on the outs outside dimension, isn't it? Well, it is. I'm looking at the inside. Well, see, a lot of people scratch building would use 16th or 1.6 mil thick brass. Well, obviously, if your frame spaces have got to be uh, such that your outside back-to-back -back dimensions yeah. um, aren't affected. I think I said earlier this morning, I use a uh, temporary brass spacers like that to hold the frames together before nice. uh, soldering up the main frame, the main spacers. Uh, these are scale seven, so these are 28.2 uh, for my prototypes, but you can use any width you like and take them off once you've got the main frames soldered up. 
Yeah, mm. uh, you can adjust them because uh, you've got screws in the end, so you can move things about and to get the, the frames actually square. Uh, and the holes that actually hold these spacers, I'll just use eight, a 10 BA screws on the end, these are 10 BA. Uh, they fit into the holes that I use for uh, plunger pickups, or yeah. if they're uh, not in the right place, just a couple of holes that I can seal up later with a piece of screw thread, uh, solder it and file it flat. Uh, I've got a frame here. Mm. I've got that's a pair of frames, uh, and I've got a oh, sorry, that's a pair of frames soldered together, and there's a hole at the end here, one in the middle, and one here. Because yeah. when they're assembled, these frames actually end up being uh tapered, so they're narrower at the front, so the spacer at the front under the uh, uh, bogey or above the bogey is narrower than it is at the main part. Uh, so you can fold the whole thing in. And this one, you can actually see I've fitted the, uh, use a pencil, I've used a, a, that hole there to fit the plunger pickup uh, guide. Um, the space oh, right, is yeah. this. I'm, I'm building two four four O's, two Two of the same class, uh, but with modifications in one um, at the same time. So mm. one frame's assembled, one's still to be settled. Well, good to see that you solder the frames together and then cut them out. <laughs> That's exactly what I did. Yeah. <laughs> this will do something right. Yeah, but what you did this morning, you had them soldered completely. I only soldered them at the end here. The solder there and the solder there. So when you come to take them apart, the, you don't need to take the solder off the inside. Just drop off. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I, had a, I, had happy, I had a happy half an hour this afternoon, or just after the, our first meeting, um, going through it and, and, and tidying it all up, and uh, that was all right. <laughs> but, uh, but I just feel that you know when you're doing a demonstration, you don't want to be doing that because it's like, it's like watching paint dry, isn't it? Oh, it is. Uh, thanks, thanks for that, uh, uh, Ian. Um, yeah. Michael, Michael Teufel is asking, what is flux? <laughs> Sorry, I'm from Germany. Well, I think we ought to explain that flux is a um, liquid or paste Chemical. which which is applied to the metal that you are soldering to prevent it from oxidising. It keeps the metal clean whilst soldering because one of the well the most important thing with soldering is that both surfaces that you are joining together must be absolutely clean and uh, th that's the purpose of flux it uh, it ensures that um, that the, the, the that the metal can't oxidize or oh, you in okay Schmelz Mittel. I was going to say, if I knew the German word for flux, I would probably... Well, that's the one I'm thinking of. It's not Ausfluss. Schmelz Mittel, I think. If I copy that, how do I do that? Multitasking here. And transfer it back again to... And reverse translate it. If you want to uh, unmute yourself, Michael, and uh, you know, if, if you're... Schmelzmitter, I think it is. Flaus. Flus. F-L-U-S-S. Yeah, but there's different... There's Plus. different... There's different is one, is one off offering. Yeah, no, but I looked at a whole lot of them. That's, that's, that's my input. <laughs> I need a German. Flussmittel in German, is somebody is saying. Oh, that, that's it. that is Michael, yes. Flussmittel. Uh, and uh, when, I studied, when I studied German at school, we never had to translate the word flux. No. I'm just wondering whether that means the same thing in German. Well, I, I used Google Translate and looked at all the different options. So it, it, it's der Fluss, river, flow, flux, circulation, or rate of flow. 
which has nothing to do with... Oh, well, it is, because it, the wow. flux allows the yeah, soul to flow, doesn't it? Yes, yes, it does, but um, that's not going to be uh, any use as a translation, is it? These virtual, uh, virtual model shows are very good. You learn a lot, don't you? <laughs> yes, you learn all about cat ailments and... Uh, all right, let's ask you the different. What is German for soldering flux? <coughs> I haven't the foggiest idea how you pronounce it, but it lot lot flux middle, yes. Was that what you were saying, Dave? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. L O T F L U W S M I double T E L. So still just a little bit tight on there. Let's see, let's see what, uh, if we warm this up a bit, see if that changes things at all. I found some, um, I found some nice uh, smaller bearings, by the way, for the, uh, for the rear axle for my collection. This is probably an obvious question. Um, I know that as, as on the real thing, when building a model loco, you all, we always tend to start with the frames, but is there any reason why, you know, you couldn't start with the superstructure? Are you asking me? <laughs> well, um, well, I did. Where's my bits from, the sm from workbench? So I started with that, didn't I? Well, yeah, yeah. Um, and, but um, if I'm building a loco, what I would, if, if it's a tender loco, the first thing I'd build is the tender because I hate building tenders. <laughs> so I would, I, 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 when I did the, um, uh, what have I got up there? Oh, I've forgotten what, what I built. Well, when I did the F-Class, I, I built the tender first, then I built the chassis, and then I, then I plunked everything on top. I'm interested in the larger scale steam models, you know, the, in the big, big gauges, five inch, seven and a quarter, and so on. And it's surprising the number of models you see at exhibitions where the guy who built it has obviously spent many, many years making the loco, building the loco, and he obviously wants to get the thing finished and running. And the tender is usually, well, in a lot of cases, is obviously very hurried. Hot wagon. Yeah. And also, uh, the paint paint job is often lets it down because you know, in having done all the interesting bits, like building the thing and getting it steaming properly, that the, the they want it. They so want to get the thing finished and on the track that. The paint job of it uh, sometimes lets lets the thing down. And of course, it's the paint job that shows off your pride and joy. Yeah, you know? and if if you have a bad paint job, then it, mm. it's a it's destined for the bring a buy stand, isn't it? I've even seen a superbly built loco at a, at a model engineer exhibition. Something like a, I don't know, let's say a seven and a quarter inch Britannia. That the numbering, the, the numbers on the cab side look to be Woolworth stick on plastic numbers, not, you know, <laughs> vinyl numbers. <laughs> I know there's somebody, well, he's a long way away from us. I'm closer to him than, than everybody else is. But, uh, and he's watching this at the moment, and he built a beautiful loco with inside working valve gear and all the rest of it. And it must be 25 years old, I'd say. He's laughing. 
Hey, you haven't painted it, have you, Dougie? When are you going to paint no, your model? I've painted it, uh, it, it, but it's not finished, Nigel. <laughs> it's got to be painted to be, to, got to be finished before I start with paint. We've not finished but, it. Uh, there's no question of it coming apart to paint it. It's all solid up solid and it would have to be painted as it is and that's it. I can and beat it, that. This loco was built in 1971. 1971? 51. 51. Yep. Not, not, not by me. Today. That hasn't been painted yet. Yeah. You were saying, Nigel, that you like to make things removable for painting. Well, this, you can take the tanks off it, you can take the cab off, you can take the bunker off, and a smoke box. It's all held together with 16, 14 and 16 BA nuts and bolts. Very nice too. But I can't claim to have built it, so uh, there we go. Oh, well, right. I, I never make my stuff dismantleable at all. In fact, the one I'm on with at the moment, the W class, I've, I've soldered the roof on. I've, pa I've painted the inside of the cab, done all the inside, put the crew in, soldered the roof on, and I haven't even started painting the outside. <laughs> so I can't do with bits that fall off. It's got to be solid for me, else so I don't want to know. You're an engineer, aren't you, sir? Well, so they say. <laughs> but, uh, indeed. Right, you can't see this because it's uh, these. Um, Would you have been so worried if the the axles have been actually loose? Um, no, because the 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 bearings and the axles are all of the same diameter, so in theory, if it's they, they shouldn't be loose, but well, not if they're. I don't mean loose, but but yeah. If it was sloppy, then I would think, well, that wasn't very good. <laughs> um, but but the purpose of this, so people understand, is if you've got your if you've got the rods together on each side. And you've got and you've got the the bearings all in place, and it's soldered up, and these these all spin round nicely. Then the in theory, when you when you first run the model, it's all right. It, it should run perfectly. Um, yeah, but it don't always work like that in engineering. <laughs> no, I do. Look what I found in the back of my cupboard. Ooh, G seven. Ooh. I was looking for an RG7, which I knew I had. I bought it on, on uh, eBay, I think I bought it. And um, I was looking for it. I was digging around to the back of the cupboard and I found a box. And in the box was various other bits and pieces. And at the bottom of it was an RG7. I've got three of them now. Spare. Oh. And, the, and there's not there. room for... There's not even room for that in it. Oh, there is. I've um, right going back to the. Oh. You can't really see it, but on the oh, gold, you can't really see it. On the drawing here, there is the outline of an RG7 drawn. Right. A dotted line in, uh, but um, but yeah. So it's going to go in on the the front driver and it will be pointing back towards the cab and actually there's loads of space that way in that configuration the only thing is is it can't make the valve gear work um, have you considered nigel using an rg4 on the back axle that's what i was just going to suggest i have used it on a seven mil loco and so have i how would an rg4 stand up sort of i'll just throw a layout at you raven spec well, I think it'd be okay. Uh, it, obviously, they're not as powerful as an RG7, 
but you can, I think they come in two or three different motor sizes. You get some, a right little squat one and one, one a fair bit longer. Yeah. Uh, and you just use the biggest one you could get in. And uh, they're, fair, they're fairly powerful. I, I, I built that saddle tank we won in. Just, and you can actually open up the axle to 316 if you're very careful. I put one in a B, uh, LSWR B4. Right. Yeah. What's that tank engine? It was a, tank engine. It was a Vulcan, Vulcan model. Yeah, 040. Yeah, well, I've got one in an 040 saddle tank. Yeah, and it worked fine. Yeah, it does work fine. So it, it's well well worth seeing, Nigel, if you could squeeze one of them in the back. Because I mean, you're not going to be pulling 20 coach trains with it, are you? No, no, no. Um, Mr. Taylor has built a beautiful Northeastern Railway I class, which is another single. There's two singles for the Northeastern Railway built. There was the I and the J. So he built the I, and I, I, uh, and I want to build the J class. And um, he went to um, Mr. Chatter Clapperton, 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 and he had he had a diesel bogey drive unit narrowed to the wheelbase of a, a tender wheelbase and did it that way didn't he I, I, and what I want to do with my J is I want to drive it off the off the off the main off the main driving wheel do it properly but I also want to have working valve gear and I'm <laughs> I just need a really narrow gearbox so you don't want it on a great big great big worm type drive you need it on a, on a stacked drive as such so make it really narrow I've, I've built a model of rocket and that's got a gearbox like that and it's it's, it's about it's too it's it it, it, it wouldn't be suitable for this loco but it's about four four millimeters wide and I, on either side of it I could put all of I could put all the valve motion um, and, and make it work but <coughs> I don't know. It's going to be one of those things, isn't it? Right. Well, I suggest you get a plan for an RG4 and just put the paper plan over your drawing. Just see how it would go. I'll, it's a possibility. I'll take a look at that, Doug. Cat's complaining again. Shut up. Um, going elsewhere for a moment. Say again. So I'm just going elsewhere for a moment. I should be back soon. Right, we'll talk about you. <laughs> right, so. You can just about see that. I'm bloody annoyed about that camera. Nigel, can I make an observation? Of course you can. Working with that box that you've got there, you seem to be quite constrained. It's like working inside a shoebox, trying to sew the things together. <laughs> yeah. I, I feel... I feel that I am in. I feel that I am. Um, I think the constraint that I have is that um, for the purpose of this demonstration, <laughs> I would have put the frame spaces in and I would have probably done a bit, bit like you've done, but I don't particularly think it's, it's for the viewers. I don't think it's, it's, it's fair on them sort of seeing me make, make something over here and uh, and come back to it so what i'm trying to do is to is to demonstrate a uh, some sort of progress on on the model but i think you're dead right mm. yeah you're dead right it would be interesting or will be interesting just to hear um 
Now, what's his name? The proprietor of a uh, Adrian. No, Anthony. Anthony Garton, Anthony. who's the proprietor of what Poppy's Wood Tech. Um, I mean, he's he he will be demo or he is demonstrating his loco building box at this very minute. Yeah. Um, it would be interesting if he were to watch your video, which of course he can do after today, and uh, possibly comment on on what, yeah. what you've just said. You know, I mean, I, I would agree with Ian. It, it, does, it does look a little bit. I well, think you certainly are constrained, aren't you? I have, I have before. I have in the past. I've used it solely for um, centering the coupling rods and making sure that it, it's running smoothly. And it works like a dream. And it's one of those th pieces of kit that you've got, which you you sort of you you use it maybe twice a year <laughs> or three times mm. a year when you're building something. Um, the last slow car I built, I didn't need one, of course, because it's only got one driver. Um, but um, for this, when I started after after lunch to to looking at reassembling the frames, I thought, oh, I could just use that. That might that will hold everything in place instead of me having to be, behave like an octopus. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, um, so I've sort of got to a point now where I'm just sort of doing a test fit to see how everything is sitting. So the, the uh, foot plate, is sitting nicely on top of the uh, on top of the frames as it, as I designed it, so I'm pleased about that. Um, I don't know how it's going to be in relation to this is a this is slightly short boiler, but the boiler will be sitting something like that. That's not that's not too bad either. So I think all my calculations have, have come out reasonably okay. Hmm. I think the boiler will probably sit a little bit higher, but that's not a problem. It, the um, the reason why I, I I extended this was a for strength and b um, because if you did look inside inside the model, there would be some form of uh, inside splasher on there. But uh, I know that Nick Dunhill with a lot of his models certainly is W class is northeastern. That, that so Dougie's working on, but but he was using, but Nick Scratch built his. Um, that had inside the inside of the tanks were, were you know were filled in as well. It was lovely. Looks really nice. We've got just well just coming up to ten minutes to go. Um, we've got to we've got to finish pretty promptly because there's other sessions which are using the same same thing. Um, same Zoom links, well, not links, but license. Um, if anybody, you know, if anybody's got any questions for Nigel, you can open up your microphone and shout out. Yeah. Um, I'm going to, what, what I'm going to do, I, I think I said it this morning, but I'm, I'm going to do an article for the Gazette and I will, I'll put the, the Czechoslovensky Drahi rail car that I built last time on there and this and I'll do a, do some photographs of of it for so people can actually see it finished and I'll also put it on the guild Facebook page as well so uh, hopefully they'll still so you'll, you'll come back and you'll say oh he, fin he actually finished it then <laughs> we haven't got to wait another 20 years for this one have we no well I promised Dougie that I'd get this done so yeah I'm on with it Doug it will look nice, Nigel, especially with that teardrop splasher, teardrop perforation splasher. It will look good. Yeah, I, I hope I think so. The though. original design would have looked better, the 440. I think that would have been tremendous because it had all the slots, horizontal slots as well. But you had, you had difficulty, yeah. You had difficulty with clearance, didn't you, with the wheels or something? It's or the. the it was the um, front bow. The front bogey um, was touching. It was touching the cylinders when it was going in a straight line. Right. And 
I was looking, I've, I've been looking at it, and I was looking at it again yesterday. Um, if it was, if the bogey was to, if the bogey was to turn, if you're going to go around a corner, you'd have to hack a great big chunk out, out of the cylinders. But the cylinders are very visible on, on that locomotive. Right, I'm with you. So, I don't know the reason why, you, why you've took umbrage with it. <laughs> yeah. um, I also took umbrage with it because the, um, optically, if you look at the top of the splasher, maybe it's better with that, that removed, if you look at the top, is it's it's got a flat top to it. Why? And and I just I, I look at it and I just think that it's an optical illusion because because it is round it, because the splasher is round. But but where it goes across onto the sandbox, I think the sandbox should have been attached to the splasher rather than it being an in, incorporated as part of it. And I thought, well, shall I just take that off and redo it? And, I'm, yeah. and, and, as I, and as I said to you before, Doug, is it, it doesn't really match up with anything else. It's sort of like, it's pre-pre-grouping, isn't it? It's out of it, it's out of it time, eh? Yeah. Well, if, I mean, if, you, if, if you get fed up with it, Nigel, you can always dismantle it and build a paddle steamer. Well, that's right. I could turn it upside down. You're halfway there. I'm halfway there, yeah. I actually, I have actually recovered quite a few bits and bobs from it for the building of this. So the, um, um, whoop, everything's falling off. So the, the, I don't know what you call this bit, the, uh, the, the strip, but the vertical. Balance. Balance. What? Balance. Balance. So balance. That's a good word. Yeah. Correct one. It's a very good word. And then under correct one, you're right. Yeah, you know, my problem, apart from the <laughs> bloody sun is in the way, my problem is that I've lived away from, from the UK for too long. I've lived away, that's a bit better, isn't it? I've lived away from the UK for too long and I'm actually forgetting words. <laughs> I don't go down to the Model Railway Club every night and talk about balances. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. and, Dave, uh, did, you read, uh, did you read out uh, Arthur Moore's comment? Uh, only just uh, he's just saying thank you. He's got yeah. to go now. No, no, no. Above, one above it. Above that, yeah. A, a quote. A quote from Phoenix Precision Paints. Brass is only there to support the paint. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Well, out in New Zealand, you can't get any paint of any sort because you, they won't post it. <laughs> <laughs> post it. Well, neither will I post it. Technically, no. I smuggle, I smuggle stuff out here, but I can't. I mean, my biggest problem now is running out of marmite. So, uh, but uh, you realise you're being, you realise you're being recorded, Nigel. <laughs> no, I don't. So you, you go out there and, and um, you know, it's fifty milliliters, isn't it? So it goes perfectly all right in your in the hand luggage. Yeah. But but if you get if you want paint sending out. Did you used to tell Floquill, Dave? Yeah. Yeah. Because I've got a whole load could, of flo Floquill. We could paint. we could send it out in the little one ounce jars, but we couldn't send it out in any great it, it was well the thinners, for example, was that were available in half litre tins. We weren't allowed to send that through the post, but we could send the one ounce one fluid ounce jars of paint. Yeah, that's it. Despite the fact that it, one of the constituents of Floquil paint was toluene, which is uh, well, one of the D's in TNT, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. And the American, so you, the American Airlines. TN, you can send it out by TNT, though. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> one of the American Airlines got a bit touchy about uh, flying uh, freight, you know, containing stuff which was explosive. Yeah. I, uh, I, send, I, send, I send batteries. They've stopped, they've stopped producing it anyway with a with solvent base. Oh, really? I've still oh, got, got a bottle on my workshop. We've got one minute to go, chat. So, um, you yeah. know, on behalf of everybody, I'll thank you, um, Nigel, for a, another entertaining afternoon session. Yeah. And uh, we'll all look forward to seeing photographs of the finished article, I think. Yeah. Model. We'll get next week. We'll get next week. 
e either that or I just put it to one side and wait until the next uh, next event and continue from there. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I don't mind like doing these. I've done it, Nige. I'm yeah. quite convinced it'll be a, a lovely bubble. I don't I don't mind doing these demonstrations if people want if people want me to come back I'm more than happy um, it's very difficult because you don't modeling is a slow process isn't it and you don't see the, the the huge sort of mass assembly that you would if it was I don't know a Helljan kit or a Helljan loco being worked on or something um, but you know if you want me to come back I'm more than happy to do so Michael Teufel sends you his thanks and said Thank you, Michael. very interesting, very interesting talk. And you're nearer to me than everybody else. <laughs> so thanks, Michael. <laughs> and likewise from Dave Robinson. So nice to see you all. Um, hope to see you uh, again. And uh, we'll obviously keep in touch and see each other on Facebook pages and all the rest. And uh, Hopefully, when we've all had our vaccines, we'll all meet up again. Yeah, that's so nice. Now, <laughs> now, now Dougie can get to bed. Now Dougie can get to bed. Yeah, yeah. The, the wife's just been calling, giving it. What time are you calling? Right, so I'm bailing out. See you all later. See you all. Yeah. I hope bye it bye. went well. Yeah. Cheers, Ian. Peter, bye. all the best in bye. Oakworth. <laughs> Thanks Real. all day for all your help as well. That's much appreciated. That's okay. Yeah, that's good. Right, so we have to go. Switching off now. Au revoir.